Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Aidan Sullivan. I'm the Vice President of Photo Assignments at Getty Images. Behind every image, there's a story. Whether that story is told by a Getty Images photographer, filmmaker, or editor, one constant remains, the passion we share for all types of imagery. For the next podcast in our ongoing series, co-founder and chief executive officer of Getty Images, Jonathan Klein, talks with award-winning photojournalist, Mario Tama. Mario joined Getty Images in 2001 and has since covered many major events around the world, including September the 11th, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and the funeral of Pope John Paul II. Mario is moving work in New Orleans covering Hurricane Katrina before, during, and the aftermath have earned him recognition from many prestigious competitions, including Pictures of the Year International, the NPPA's Best of Photojournalism competition, and the White House News Photographers Association. You may have recently seen these award-winning images in National Geographic, Newsweek, and Time.com. Today, Mario describes what his life is like as a Getty Images photojournalist based in New York City, who spends his days helping people tell their stories and giving them a voice through his images. So Mario, the first question I had for you, how did you get into photojournalism? My father gave me my first camera. I was always surrounded by photography, especially pictures that my grandfather had taken back in uh, World War II, prior to World War II in Europe, before they emigrated to the States. And it became kind of a fascinating thing for me, and, it, and I realized what a powerful tool that photography was to, to capture uh, history and capture your, yourself in history and other people in history. And so I went on and to Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, at that time, I was really into landscape photography. I didn't know I wanted to be a photojournalist. Learning about photojournalism forced me to come out of my shell a bit as a person and to interact with these people. So it was a way for me to experience worlds that I didn't know anything about. And that, in and of itself, was really interesting for me. It was a key to opening up the door to people's lives. Your personality developed with that camera in your hand. It's true. It's true. It, you know, it, it, it's almost something that can go back to prehistoric times. If they walked out of their cave, they brought their tool with them. My tool was my camera. Right. It was, it was a way for me to experience worlds that I didn't know anything about. And do you feel that you could have the same relationship and rapport with people without the camera? It, it's always something that's helpful for me. And it's a way, it's a conversation starter. And, and yeah. when people see the camera, oftentimes they'll come up to you and start telling you their stories. And those stories that they're telling you when you listen, you really start to learn about what's happening. And that's one of the best ways to, to be a journalist is to listen. Now, many photojournalists refer to the camera as their almost emotional protection from what's happening in front of them. Has it helped you emotionally by looking at the scene through the lens. Once you put the camera up to your, your eye, you realize that you're doing a job, and you're doing a job to bring these people's stories uh, to other people around the globe. And at that moment, you're able to disconnect emotionally, at least somewhat. Of course, you're still empathetic, and you're, and you're channeling that empathy through your f photographs as opposed to becoming so emotionally overwrought that you can't actually work. Have you ever got to a position where you were on the edge of not being able to work due to the emotion? Yeah, I can remember one time in a, an orphanage uh, for disabled children in Baghdad or where uh, the, the screams and the cries and the echoes and the smells and just the total, uh, complete, overwhelming sensation from all the senses kind of just caused me to stop and have to walk out and kind of regroup. Now, your career, with us anyway, pretty much started with 9-11. Clearly a, a very high impact moment, especially for somebody who, who lives and is based in, in New York. Tell us a bit about you know, what you were looking for. I remember walking out of my apartment and walking around to the corner and seeing that hole in the South Tower. I was really struck by the hearts and souls of New Yorkers, these cold, supposedly cold, yeah. uncaring New Yorkers. I remember one guy specifically in a hardware store just throwing shovels out the door mm. to anyone that would go by who were trying to dig people out. Seeing these scenes kind of reinforced for me the need to show that the people were still, these people still had hope and they were still trying to come back. There's one picture in particular that I think of, and it's a picture of a line of a bucket brigade of firefighters 
standing amidst the, the rubble. It's three days later, and they've got this bucket brigade, and they're just searching just and trying to, to look for any kind of person to rescue. And to me, at that moment, I remember taking that picture and, and thinking that this sums it all up. You've become extremely well-known for your extraordinary work in New Orleans. How did it happen that this, this guy has become very, very attached to that city, and f in fact, the, the primary person documenting the story of that city? You know, as photojournalists, most of the time we look at a place through the prism of disaster. For me with New Orleans, I had visited four or five times before, and I had already fallen in love with the city, hmm. and I had fallen in love with the people and the beauty of its culture and, and, and just the fascinating way these people live their lives and their hospitality, and I've, I was always taken in, and, and I felt like it was a home away from home before the storm happened. So to then see these same people go through this and to see them abandoned by our own government was just absolutely shocking to me. And uh, I just felt it was my duty as someone who knew what New Orleans, to keep following it and to keep doing whatever small part I could to remind people that these New Orleanians are still there and they're still trying to bring that city back to where it is. I guess there's a part of me that just feels like I have to keep going back until it becomes that city that I fell in love with in the beginning. And did you imagine, having been to other parts of the world, that this was actually happening in the U.S.? I think that was one of the biggest shocks for me and for everyone. You know, when we are sent out to Iraq or Afghanistan, we psychologically prepare, we physically prepare, we know what we're going to get into, you know. Yes. When, when you get sent down to cover, a, you know, a possible storm passing in your own uh, country, you know, you think the worst you're going to see is is maybe a few people are killed and, you know, a few houses destroyed. But to see the absolute societal breakdown of of an entire American city in front of your own eyes was for me uh, completely uh, incomprehensible, as you said. Do you still have some hope, or do you feel that the public consciousness has moved on? <clears throat> I am hopeful because it's such a place of such vibrancy and energy, and, and that kind of connection, uh, I think, is something that will help New Orleans rebuild in the future. Each time I go down, I feel like there's an increment or two that's gained. Compared to two years ago, it's a much better place, and I would certainly encourage and anyone to go down there and visit, because the best thing that anyone can do is just to contribute to the economy. Yeah. Uh, most of the touristic areas and, and a lot of the, the cultural areas have been rebuilt. You could have shot a political photo story to show what the government didn't do, but that's not what you chose to do. You chose to shoot the people. Right, and I think some photojournalists go into those situations and they just try to make the people look as miserable as possible. <laughs> and uh, if you look at my pictures, there's a lot of hope there and yeah. because that's what I feel when I go into those places. I want to show what they really are like and... and Anyone who's walked through those neighborhoods, uh, spent enough time there, knows that there's a lot of joy there in spite of all the misery. Talk to me about uh, this image over here because it, it's always resonated with people who've seen it. As I, my foot was going down, the, the brightness of it obviously caught my eye and I jumped out of the way and stepped next to it. And what was unbelievable to me was that it, it was lying there untouched uh, in this beautiful aura of light and uh, if you look at it very closely and blow it up you can actually see some of the purple and pink strings slowly melding into the mud. When we look at, at some of the pictures of, of the people, do you have a, a particular relationship with any of the subjects? I, I try to reconnect with with the people that I've, I've established friends, friendships with and it's a great way not only to reconnect but to get some information about the community. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's one particular community. I know a lot of people there. Almost all of the housing projects have been torn down in New Orleans following the storm. And, well, and this one remains. We're not sure why it happened. I, I hope it has something to do with the media attention, but there's uh, about 200 people or, or so that are living there now in this one tiny little pocket, and it's a wonderful glimpse into the past of New Orleans. While it may, may look very rough to us, yeah. To these people, it's their home. It's where they grew up. Well, you've got a very iconic shot of the Superdome. Again, it looks like the light mm. was kind. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it looked like one small sliver of light from heaven peering its way into the gates of hell. Uh, 
I walked into the Superdome that day, and I'll, I'll never forget the stench, which was just overwhelming and, and reeked of death. And there's these few people there gathered on, on the bottom, and they're, they're just motionless. They're just beaten. They're just destroyed there. They're just lying there. They're, I don't know what the heat was in there, but it, it must have been maybe 120 degrees. And I, I shot for about three or four minutes, could barely focus because the, the sweat's just coming down your face and wow. you know your eyes are burning. And to think that that's what's happening to me, God knows what these people are feeling and the people that were, that were stuck in there for so many days. Well, I think there's, there's no way, thanks to your work, and your continuing work that it will be forgotten. And I also give a tremendous amount of credit to some of the magazines, in particular National Geographic. And they've really done a fantastic job about keeping this in the public eye. I hope through my pictures and through some other people's pictures that people realize that the people themselves are, are very positive, spiritual, <laughs> wonderful, engaging people. and. They're the thing, they're the backbone of this, of this city, and they're the ones that are going to get it going again. And as I said before, all you need to do is take one visit down there for a weekend, and, and you'll learn more than, than you probably can in my pictures. You've spent a fair amount of time on the election. And have you covered many elections? Uh, I have. I've covered uh, the 2000 election. Um, so at that time, I was covering Bill Clinton, going around this New York State uh, campaigning for Hillary Clinton. So you did that election, 2004? Yeah, 2004, I, I followed Bush for uh, a couple weeks on his re-election campaign. I'll never forget the day that Bush was inaugurated, uh, standing out on Pennsylvania Avenue for about six, eight hours before his motorcade came up there, and it was the most freezing, pouring. gray, miserable, Yeah horrific day. But this election by far has been the most fascinating. I mean, you can't even really compare. Just from a pure photographic point of view, uh, Barack Obama is is someone that, that is a photographer's dream. I mean, <laughs> he does a good job of, of portraying that he has a certain depth to his soul, and it certainly looks that way through photographs. Well, you've seen him pretty close up. I'm surprised you're not more cynical about politicians, but this guy seemed to have maybe brush that cynicism away. I am cynical, and I'm certainly not going to call him the messiah or anything like that. But, you know, a lot of politics is about conversation, about eloquence. And if you talk about someone who's steered a conversation, he's been able to steer the entire conversation in America. You also said earlier on that you really enjoyed covering McCain. And um, this is a terrific, intimate moment between McCain and a, a soldier. Perhaps talk to us a little about this photo. What happens a lot of times is when McCain is working the rope line, there'll be about maybe 15 uh, photographers clamoring for one spot, trying to get a, two or three pictures before you get knocked out by the next wave. And I was able to work my way back to the front. That soldier said something that, that st stirred something in McCain that made him stop in his boots and grab, grab him by his arms. And it's such a loud venue that there was no way for us to hear what he was yeah. saying. That's the beautiful thing about photography. Uh, there are certain moments that simply transcend what what human nature is all about and that uh, illuminate what, what's going on in our hearts. And I think, hopefully, in pictures like that, uh, we're able to do that. You talk about body language a lot. Let's begin with some images of Obama and Senator Clinton on the day she conceded and endorsed him. There were quite a few moments on that day, and it's and and it, it was really illustrative of of the complex relationship that they have. One in particular is this vertical picture where Barack has his hand on Hillary's shoulder, and he's got I think one or two fingers on his shoulder, <laughs> gently nudging her off stage after she gave her speech. There's another image uh, where Barack's clasping her her hand and and taking her in a warm embrace and he's looking directly at her but she's sort of looking off into the distance even though the images look like they're engaged there is this distance there is and and that in that picture in in the body language in the shape of his hand he's kind of uh, gesturing with his hand that he's perhaps, you know, not really all that interested in what she's saying. And she's not even looking directly at him. She's kind of looking out the window, kind of wondering what she should say to get him to open up. But his eyes are kind of 
almost half closed, like he's kind of daydreaming a little bit. When we go <laughs> on to John McCain at the podium and Sarah Palin. That day when, when, they, when McCain first introduced Sarah Palin, we were all waiting for that moment of the two coming out together at the podium, grasping hands, throwing their hands up in the air in that kind of victory stereotypical picture. And we, we never saw that and we were wondering what was happening. And this happened shortly thereafter where John McCain was at the stage behind his country first sign, looking out at the crowd. And Sarah is off a good distance to his left, waving off to the crowd, almost not even realizing that he's there or caring that he's there only after going through the edit and looking at their body language that I came to the conclusion that these people had probably never met before, or maybe once or twice before, because there just was no chemistry between them. No connection. Them. Is it important when you're shooting to remain unbiased? Our, our, my job as a photojournalist when I walk out of my apartment is to leave all of that, um, I, would, I would almost call it baggage, behind, because that's, that's going to affect the way you look at the world and affect the way that your pictures are, 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 being, um, are being represented. And uh, I absolutely believe in the creed of, of maintaining um, a neutral bias when you're covering things like politics. I challenge anyone to look at my pictures of the two candidates and tell me who I was voting for. What stories do you want to do next? Looking at uh, this this financial crisis, um, I think uh, it's not, not just that I think everyone kind of realizes that this is going to have a dramatic effect first and foremost on the poor around the world, the impoverished. And so what I intend to do in 2009 is to um, follow those stories, whether they be in America or, or other parts of the globe. And obviously, it's going to be a global phenomenon. I mean, you don't have to go very far. Uh, there's, a, there's a picture in here of um, a line of thousands of workers ended up lining up for this IRS job fair. We're, we're going down to Wall Street all the time, and we're, we're looking for any kind of events, but eventually wanting to, of course, get into the communities and really see how the individual communities are being affected. Well, thanks a lot. We could carry on talking about so many of these images. I really appreciate everything you do for, for us. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's my pleasure.